So today's event um, has a special focus and meaning for all of uh, us here. Um, so the theme is uh, writers and migrants. Um, and um, we have uh, the pleasure of having uh, invited um, Professor Robert Hampson uh, as um, the moderator for this session. And um, so, and uh, while um, Robert will probably in introduce um, um, our poets for tonight. Um, I just wanted to give a very brief uh, introduction about uh, um, Professor Hampson. So uh, Robert is a research fellow at the Institute for English Studies currently um, and, and also a visiting professor at the University of Northumbria. He, um, he has also been a professor emeritus of modern literature at Royal Holloway, as uh, many of you might know. Um, where he taught um, the MA in Creative Writing. He has also published extensive research on Joseph Conrad, cross-cultural encounters, migration and transnationalism, and contemporary poetry. So, um, and I would also like to mention to you all um, just a few housekeeping, um, you know, uh, guidelines about um, today. So, because uh, just in order to make it easy for our readers, um, would you mind to um, mute your um, uh, phone, uh, your audio, um, unless you are actually going to um, ask some questions at the Q&A or if you are the poets um, presenting your work. Um, and um, so the first part of it will be um, the re reading and then um, during the Q&A, you, you're most welcome to drop your um, question to the, in the chat or raise your hands. But I will leave that, um, uh, the the whole program um, to Robert now. So um, he will introduce their speakers. Thank you very much, Jenny. And um, I'm delighted to have been invited to moderate this, this session. Um, the format for this evening is going to be, we'll have three readings, and then we'll, I will then initiate some discussion among the poets with a, a handful of questions that I've already advised, uh, warned them about. And then I'll open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, so we have three poets reading this evening. Um, the first poet will be Mary Jean Chan. Um, Mary Jean was born in Hong Kong. She's the author of Flesh, published by Faber and Faber in 2019. Uh, Flesh won the 2019 Costa Book Award for Poetry and was shortlisted in 2020 for the International Dylan Thomas Prize, the Jalak Prize, and the Seamus Heaney Center First Collection Poetry Prize. Um, Mary Jean Chan is Senior Lecturer in Creative Writing Poetry at Oxford Brookes University and a Supervisor on the MST in Creative Writing at the University of Oxford. She is a Contributing Editor at Oxford Poetry and will be Writer-in-Residence at the Nanyang Technological University School of Humanities in Singapore in 2022. The second reader is Jennifer Wong, whom we've already met. Um, Jennifer was born and grew up in Hong Kong. She's the author of several collections, including Goldfish from Chameleon Press, and a pamphlet, Diary of a Mew Mew Sales Girl from Bitter Melon Press. Her latest collection, Letters Home from Nine Arches Press in 2020, explores the complexities of history, migration and translation. It was named the PBS, the Poetry Book Society, Wildcard Choice. Um, she studied in Oxford and completed a creative writing PhD from Oxford Brooks. She teaches creative writing at the Poetry School and at Oxford Brooks University. Her poems, reviews and poetry translations have appeared in World Literature Today, Oxford Poetry, The Rialto, Magma Poetry, Poetry Review, Poetry London, PN Review, and the Asian Review of Books. Um, she's been writer in residence at Wasafiri for 2020 and 2021. And then our third reader will be Marilyn Chin. Uh, Marilyn Chin was also born in Hong Kong, raised in Portland, Oregon. She received a, P a BA from the University of Massachusetts Amherst in Chinese literature and an MFA from the University of Iowa. Her books have become Asian American classics and are taught on classrooms, in classrooms internationally. Her most recent book is A Portrait of the Self as Nation, New and Selected Poems from Norton in 2018. <laughs> um, she's won numerous awards, the Ruth Lilly Prize for Lifetime Achievement in Poetry, the United States Artist Foundation Award, the Radcliffe Institute Fellowship at Harvard, the Rockefeller Foundation Fellowship, five Pushcart Prizes, a Fulbright Fellowship to Taiwan, and, and many others. 
2017, she was honored by the Asian Pacific Islander Caucus in the California Assembly for her activism and her excellence in education. She's featured in a variety of important anthologies, including the Norton Anthology of Literature by Women and the Norton Anthology of Modern and Contemporary Poetry, as well as the Penguin Anthology of 20th Century Poetry. In addition to writing poetry and fiction, she's also translated poetry by various Asian writers um, from Vietnamese, Chinese, and also Japanese. Uh, so for example, she's co-translated poems by the Japanese poet um, Gozo Yoshimashu. She's currently Professor Emerita at San Diego State University, and she serves as Chancellor of the Academy of American Poets. So I'll now hand over to Mary Jean to, for the first of this evening's readings. Thank you so much, Robert, um, and to Jenny for organizing this event. It's a real honor to be reading with you and with Marilyn. Um, it's just lovely to see the Poetics of Home Festival come together, and I think it means a lot to a lot of us in the Chinese diaspora. So I'll um, tonight read six poems. I thought I'd sort of open and close with a poem from Flesh, and then I'll read you some newer work. And this first poem is called The Importance of Tea. When your aunt arrived, she asked for normal tea, which to my untrained ears sounded a bit like normality. In Hong Kong, normal tea is green or white or red. It took my mind several moments to move from green to white to red to land on black. Your aunt was flexible. Any Assam, Darjeeling or Earl Grey? We only had matcha, some loose leaf iron Buddha in the cupboard, no milk. Your aunt looked at you as if you'd failed at being British, me as if I'd failed to properly assimilate. Afterwards, you said I was projecting onto your aunt the fears I harbored. No matter how many years I've spent in this country, how I interpret normal tea, what is normal to me? You are learning Mandarin Chinese. I see how the characters are split for you. Signifier and signified refuse to conjoin. That's what happened when your aunt asked for the normal tea. Days later, when a waiter brought us white sugar for our oolong at a cafe, I caught your gaze. We laughed and left the sachets unopened. Uh, and the next few poems are from a newer collection in progress. Ars Poetica. At 20, you were as far away from poetry as you now are from the sea. A man once asked you where you found grace. You told him in a poem. For years, you thought touch was the tap running, your fingers braiding the soft water, or the shower spilling incandescently over a shamed torso. At an airport in Texas, a barista playfully asked if you were a professional tennis player, praising your broad shoulders. You were in transit to attend a slam poetry contest, yet you felt seen somehow. So you cleave to that small identity all afternoon. Comforted, you had a place in that brutal country, beautiful in a certain light. That summer, you finally returned home as yourself, then left once more, clutching a slim book of poems close on the flight to New York, each word a warm hand to keep you back from the edge of things, a hum to bring back the hallelujah. Fully human. In a room of my own, I ponder the meaning of silence. Being silenced is new for some, but not for others. Ask the queer child, ask her what she knows about quiet, about the intimate knowledge of a fire alarm going off that only she can hear, that no one will believe existed. She leaves for another country, exiles herself from the familiar, the family, the sea surrounding the fragrant city. Departure was once fleeing, necessary, fraught. Try living in the romanticized elsewhere. The sensation of being watched is daily and casual. Try feeling unsafe on public transport. Try being seated at the same table as the esteemed scholar in all souls who insists on sharing his expertise, how the British brought culture, language, the law, 
he smiles. Her most clipped diction fills the one lull as he refills his wine glass. She can tell he has enjoyed their chat, that he wants to continue devouring the most pleasant sight of her acquiescence. To be a diverse thing in a country that won't see you as fully human. Are you listening? I have paid that price knowing that nowhere is entirely safe from harm, racialized and queer as I am. Apologies for the slightly uh, gray tone of these poems, but a lot of these poems were written sort of post um, sort of pandemic and during the lockdowns in the UK. And a lot of these thoughts came coalescing together, partly because of COVID racism in response to the different policies that were emanating from different governments. And so there's a kind of tone of, I suppose, fear and anxiety that runs through some of these new poems. Bright fear. During these lengthening days of sunlight and bright fear, there is too much language and too little time. I am afraid. I am left to search for desire indoors, my hands steeped always too long in soap then the wetness and the drying, to allow once more for soiling, another faint gesture at the world, so I won't lose sight of its ribbon beauty. I used to dream about whole days of quiet. Now I seek solace in sound, the TV humming its doomsday tune. On the bus, I keep my staff badge on my neck, hoping it'll ward off a fist in dusk or daylight. A man from Singapore was beaten up for wearing a mask and I can't help but remember his face, his resigned expression on the six o'clock news. I enter the classroom feeling the inward twist of what has come before, histories, memories, facts. This is grief as daily bread. The body is in pain and what surges through the soul seats us on the sofa and leaves us there for hours till lovers rouse us to eat to partake in the rituals of a life. All fear is grief and all grief is salt. The way my mother sobs about wanting me back home, how tears emerge as prayer or song, how they come on like poems. Home. It is my eighth year in the UK and I have never felt more unsafe. At least you live in London, a friend said. In this city, there are more people like myself. What is this impulse to blend in? As a teenager, I tried so hard to perform that magic trick that I nearly disappeared. My therapist asks, what does it feel like to disappear? I said, like seeing others, but not realizing that they can see you too. Like thinking that nothing you do matters like palpitations of the heart. At least you have a British passport, a friend said. Maybe you should come see for yourself how a country so vast can make you feel so small. I will not read you a poem in Chinese. I will not speak softly. I will not be grateful. At least there are some good people, a friend said. There will always be good people. When I first arrived, I thought I could finally disappear among the spires, that my face could be a neutral surface, pleasant and serene like a pond. The college porters were seldom convinced I belonged. A pub refused to acknowledge my student ID and told me to leave. At least you have a degree from Oxford, a friend said. But I am tired. I am 30 and this country has aged me. Where can I go? Home, my therapist said is where you don't have to explain yourself. Where is that place? Perhaps here is home in the poem, where we can sit together, where you will speak and I will listen, where I speak and you hear me unequivocally. And I'll just end with a short poem from Flesh. Thank you for listening. Wish. I would like to live like the trees. My lover often says, look up as she admires a canopy of green. Her tree-like behavior astounds me. 
If you looked within me now, you'd see that my languages are like roots snarled in soil, one and indivisible, except the world divides me endlessly. Some days I dare not look at the trees. They are such hopeful creatures. If the legislators of our world look to their trees for guidance, would they reconsider everything? Lately, I've been trying to write a poem that might birth a tree. A genuine acceptance of the self continues to elude me. Thank you. Thank you much, very much, Mary Jean, for that start. Thank you. The second reader will be um, Jennifer Wong. Thank you very much. And um, I would like to read you a few poems uh, from my collection uh, that is from. So this one um, is about uh, my arrival to um, England uh, when I first arrived in, uh, to study my EPA. And um, back then I was quite, um, I really had very little experience traveling uh, anywhere. And um, so uh, it, it was like quite a, you know, like a, stressful journey but um, when I first arrived I just find it it's really exciting and at the same time um, there were you know lots of things that I don't know and um, I came here uh, to study at Oxford and um, and also to um, you know with a scholarship so um, it's a very different scenario because um, I always felt that like everything in England is very expensive and so on and um, so we ended up bringing loads of luggage uh, with me um, just like my other friends who came on uh, you know like uh, from a more working class background so um, and I think this uh, you you understand you know like this feeling of um, you know yeah nostalgia as well as um, you know feeling excited and being on an adventure. Arrival, October 1998. When I first arrived, I did not tell anyone that I had a rice cooker in my suitcase. You would miss rice over there, your mo my mother said. At customs, the officer glanced at the letter embossed with the college crest, five yellow birds. Why would they offer you a place at Oxford? He shook his head and stamped, limited leave to remain. Two, Helen's Court was where they put all the foreign students together so they feel more at home. A bed sit waiting for his tenant. Empty bookshelves, a quaint looking desk, a worn out armchair, a lamp with a green shade. I opened the sash window and heard a faint trail of bicycle bells. Home, I said, but it hurt. Three, the post room. Among the narrow wooden shelves, I was the only one there. My parents would be pleased. Mum told me she went to Yinky to stock up on tea leaves and to Mayfu where she knew the best fishmonger. Her letters were full of questions. How cold is England's cold? Should we send more instant noodles? Four. Each week, I went to Sainsbury's to improve my English. Walking up and down the busy aisles, I relish the sound of each exotic word, gorgette, crumpets, red Leicester cheese, horseradish. I smiled. Saying it right is such an art. Here, they actually have Chinese cabbage. At night, I leave the butter and milk outside the window to keep it chilled. Five. On winter days when the sun went missing and I felt I was an incomplete being, I visit Adamame, hidden on Holywell Street, just like the other ramen place in Yamate with its wooden screen doors. There, people would queue for ages for a bowl of miso happiness. Sometimes, in the middle of my lunch at Adamame, it felt as if me and my brother were having noodles together, as he asked me to repeat after him the names of his favorite players, Rooney, Fellini, Raphael, De Geer. Um, and for a, quite a short while, I worked um, in London in, in a rather very strange shop, um, in, in Miu Miu fashion shop. And, uh, and it was like, um, 
there, I, I think it was really amazing to know that like some people are buying like uh, boots, uh, boots 2000 pounds, just like to for, you know, in less than 10 minutes. And I thought like, it's really fascinating because you will have these, all these con concepts about who are the migrants and um, am I a migrant or not? Am I the same as them? Um, and so uh, this is a poem about that sort of complexity about people, like, you know, even though we came from the same place. Diary of a Miu Miu sales girl. I am wearing a crepe de chine dress and suede stilettos that do not belong to me. I'm carrying nothing but my lies and my absolute lipstick, red as a warning. I'm rather good at this smiling game, speaking Mandarin to the customers. The trick is to flatter them, flattered as they already are, being wives of the newly rich from a changing China. They wear sunglasses and diamond rings even when they sleep. At home, they play mahjong and drink longjing, dress only in European ready to wear, a tea with velvet trim, Chanel denim jacket with a real emerald collar, flip-flops lined with rabbit fur. They always pay in cash. They have a home in England and in other European cities. For them, flying long haul is more bearable with a pre-flight Swedish massage. More worthwhile if they bring home a Miu Miu bag with the latest buckle. In our home country, we would never have met. But here I have touched their ways, know their bra sizes and their children's names, working in this store in the heart of Mayfair, where each evening I go home with my sore feet, slip out of my black dress like a fish. Um, I think also uh, for me, home, um, it's a very complicated feeling. And I am, um, for a long time, I was thinking about also Bajin's uh, book. Um, it's called Home or called Family, depending on your translation. And it has to do with, um, you know, like uh, this resistance against or rebellion against um, feudalism or traditional ideas, traditional beliefs. Um, and when I read it, I felt really touched at the fact that, like, as writers, you can really um, create change. You can, you can, um, you know, and have like the privilege of knowing um, what's in the past, what's in history, and to rewrite, rewrite that, and to create change. So this is a poem dedicated to Bajin and his novel, um, which a lot of I know that a lot of Chinese people have read. That poem in your book, Ga, with its golden roof, was the first warning. A beautiful mansion in the name of Confucian living. Ga, where everyone has to be, be as perfect as a porcelain face. In their embroidered robes, the parents sit in Qing dynasty chairs made of rosewood. Virtuous statues, giving daily lessons of four nose to the young. Fei lai ma si. Happy are those who stay silent and notice nothing, feel nothing. Unhappy are those who are young at heart. Cursed are those who battle with the giant. 1923. When you left Sichuan, your jia, what were you thinking? Ga is home or family or none of those. But Shanghai was not big enough for you. Four years later, you boarded a ship for Paris, France, a paradise for dreamers. In the Latin Quarter, you wrote in the day, in a flat that reeked of onions, and studied French at night. Chuguo, a sad word, a brave word, who but an exiled youth could write what you did? Who could question our fathers? We are all leaving our fathers, fathers who feed the family, who appoint wives for young men, fathers who put duties on our shoulders, fathers who ruled our land, 
God and our universe, we are always leaving our fathers. To read Gar in Oxford, seventy years away from the fresh ink of those pages, I see students cycle to their colleges made of dreams and sandstone, to the world they are defiant to change, just like Jehui in your book. Their strands of hair catch the gold in the sun. Um, I would also like to read you this poem that is has to do with um, um, giving birth to in England and being a mother in um, in England feels very strange because you're making decisions not just for yourself but for your next generation and um, knowing that uh, we will be me and my daughter they uh, we are so different. Um, she she she's got British passport um and at that moment I don't like um I feel like although she's from me uh, at the same time she's um she's her own person and what is her future that that she has real life thesis woke up five minutes before she did time enough for a latte butter on my toast put on perfume scribbled a line of poetry with eyebrow pencil unsurprised to spot a silk road of pains trailing the fridge, my handbag in the drum of the washing machine. Like a slacker caught red-handed, I hurriedly dished out cocoa pops, peeled a pear, turned on CBBs, warmed up her milk. I sat next to her, typed up two paragraphs of my thesis, ordered groceries, read tweets, from somewhere on the other side of the earth where Ocean Vong was winning prizes and weeping at the ceremony. Mummy Scooter, she held my hand and we hopped out into the garden, a shared grassy plot where she spent her first summer. More than anything or any poem, we wanted to buy a house. The other day, someone made a flattering remark about Charlotte's hand knitted cardigan except I couldn't say I got it from a charity shop. In my dreams, there's hardly any knitting, only a stitching back of the woman I was, who saw life filled with promise, had the luxury of wandering and musing all day in that sandstone city of gargoyles where students cycle past, their black gowns flapping in the wind. What does she mean by life in a semi-transparent envelope? what to do with the fragments I never understood. A woman who stood all day in high heels, selling antique elephants and rare gems, walked up seven flights of stairs in a tong lao six months into her pregnancy, who lost her temper so easily, screamed and sank the teeth of a comb into her child's skin. Some days or nights I thought of it, all of this, the love I have. In another life, I want to be a free woman, much love for her writing, her fortitude. But here and now, your warm hand is the only thing I'll miss. Um, and I also wanted to uh, read to you um, this poem um, that I have written quite recently. Um, I think um, it's very hard to think about um, ourselves as migrants with a past and how to kind of reconcile the past and you know at the same time you feel like you're always living in two different worlds and um, so for quite a long while especially during the last two years um, I find it really hard to catch up with the news in Hong Kong um, it's as if you are always participating in the history of your own hometown, um, even though that you have left. And especially, of course, I'm um, seeing um, the protests um, happening. It could be really painful to witness and knowing that you are not there at the same time. So uh, this poem was also inspired because um, I was I did spend some time there when uh, when the protests happened um, when I was visiting home. Uh, so it, it has this double sense of being there and not being there and um, and the kind of the sort of uh, invisible trauma or pain of um, sharing that sense of um, knowledge, um, the same sense that your friends and family uh, will share, but without 
li literally being there. Between our voice and our silence, it's a summer we believe in, phone lights flashing along the lion's rock, before we wake up in a shrouded city where your tongue tastes of metal and you struggle to erase the scenes of clashes between your own people. You can't talk about it, but they are locked in your head. Graffiti messages, the tributes to the dead, a campus under siege, and stricken faces live streamed on TV. Nothing you learned at school has prepared you for this moment when the city crumbles and you no longer know how to teach your children the meaning of sirens, of bricks, of barriers, of scarred streets and metro stations, broken windows, broken bodies. In unforgiving weather, a sea of black heads fill the concrete, pleading because they must. A song is not a threat. A word is not a threat. A candle is not a threat. When they demand from you what you cannot give, and when they ask you about the colour of your heart, is it the loyal shade of chameleon or the colour of sand? And then we arrive at this new monsoon season of silence, and the rain cleanses almost everything. The cars, the houses, the parks, the books, and walls, except for my heart of stone and sand and a song I can't sing. So um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jenny. And the third reader tonight is Marilyn Chin. I'll hand over to Marilyn. <clears throat> and can you hear me? Can you hear me, everybody? Okay. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Um, and Jenny Wong for putting this together. You're just, oh, you're the bomb. You're great. <laughs> and thank you, Robert uh, Hampson, for, uh, for, you know, for taking care of young poets. You <laughs> and it's so nice to meet you, <laughs> Mary Jean. Um, so I feel like I'm jamming with my friends. That's, yeah, it's it, it feels great. I am the OG, the original gangster. <laughs> I've been writing for many years, and um, and and you know I'm I'm going to read from my uh, from my uh, selected poems, uh, a portrait of the South as nation, and uh, oh, well, it's thirty. It's a like best hits album from thirty years of work. For for goodness sake, uh, you know I'm older than yeah than I look. You know. <laughs> I have good hair dye. Um, so I'm going to um, be. Uh, I'm going to read as a counterpoint to the to the readers thus far, and I would like to um, concentrate on hybrid forms. And I'm um, and I'm going to begin with a poem called "Blues on Yellow." The the canary died in the gold mine. Her dreams got lost in the sieve. The canary died in the gold mine. Her dreams got lost in the sieve. Her husband, the crow, killed under the railroad. The spokes has shorn his wings. Something's cooking in Chin's kitchen. 10,000 yellow belly sapsuckers baked in a pie. Something's cooking in Chin's kitchen. 10,000 yellow belly sapsuckers baked in a pie. Something's cooking in Chin's kitchen. Die, die, yellow bird, die, die. Oh, crack an egg on the griddle. Yellow will ooze into white. Oh, crack an egg on the griddle. Yellow will ooze into white. Run, run, sweet little Puritan. Yellow will ooze into white. If you cut my yellow wrists, I'll teach my yellow toes to write. If you cut my yellow wrists, I'll teach my yellow toes to write. If you cut my yellow fists, I'll teach my yellow feet to fight. Do not be afraid to perish, my mother. Buddha's compassion is nigh. 
Do not be afraid to perish, my mother. Our boat will sail tonight. Your babies will reach the promised land. The stars will be their guide. I am so mellow yellow, mellow yellow, Buddha sings in my veins. I am so mellow yellow, mellow yellow, Buddha sings in my veins. Oh, take me to the land of the unreborn. There is no life on earth without pain. There's no such, <laughs> you, one must end a blues poem with the word pain, right? So I, I try to merge the blues poem, a la um, Bessie Smith, with the Chinese lyric in, in, you know, in, this, uh, in this experiment. <laughs> um, so I'm going to read some Chinese quatrains. I've been working on Chinese quatrains all my life. I guess they're Chinese-American quatrains. So I... Um, so uh, they are dread, you know, uh, the Chinese dread you, the, uh, the quad chain form goes back, you know, eons. <laughs> and and I, was, um, I was a Chinese um, studies major, a classical Chinese major as an undergraduate. And I really love uh, the, the uh, cut verse form um, goes going back to, um, to the Tang Dynasty, Li Bai Du Fu, and going back to uh, the Shi Jing. So I mix those with um, with English ballad. But uh, yeah, and so, yeah, so um, I, I'll, I'll read them. You can hear the English ballad sneaking in. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, uh, but uh, okay. Yeah, Chinese quatrains, the woman in tomb, 44. The airplane is shaped like a bird or a giant mechanical penis. My father escorts my mother from girlhood to unhappiness. You know, this is a feminist poem when penis rhymes with unhappiness, right? Okay, that's just, that's just a side. Um, a dragonfly has iridescent wings. Shorn is a lowly pissmire, plucked of arms and legs, a throbbing red pepper pod. Baby, she's a girl, pinkly propped as a doll. Baby, she's a pearl, an ulcer in the oyster of God. Cry, little baby clam, cry. The steam has opened your eyes, your secret darkly hidden. The razor is sharpening the knife. Abandoned towel leaf boat is lonely black sail broken. The corpse are fat and bejeweled. The hull is thoroughly rotten. The worm has entered the ear and out the nose of my father clean the pelvis of my mother and ring the round her finger bone. One child beats a bedpan, one beats a fish hook out a wire, one beats his half sister on the head. Oh, teach us to fish and love. Don't say her boudoir is too narrow. She could sleep but in one cold bed. Don't say you own many horses. We escaped on her skinny mare's back. Man is good, said Mengzi. We must cultivate their natures. Man is evil, said Xunzi. There's a worm in the human heart. He gleaned a beaded purse from Hong Kong. He procured an oval fan from Taiwan. She married him for a green card. She, he abandoned her for a blonde. My grandmother is calling her goslings. My mother is summoning her hens. The sun has vanished into the ocean. The moon has drowned in the fen. Disc of jade for her eyelids. A lozenge of pearl for her throat. Lapis and kudzu in her nostrils. They will rob her again. 
and again. So, you know, the whole, uh, the fan is for, <laughs> is, is my British part. Because <laughs> there are no fans in Chinese poetry, right? So, you know, I, uh, um, Humphrey, some weird, strangely, yeah, some occasional poems. Uh, this is called Black President, and it's a quasi sonnet. Um, and yeah, with embedded cut verse, a uh, Chinese cut verse. Okay, it's called Black President. If a black man could be president, could a white man be his slave? Could a sinner enter heaven by uttering his name? If the Terminator is my governor, could a cowboy be my king? When shall the cavalry enter Deadwood and save my prince? An exo-cannibal eats her enemies. An endo-cannibal eats her friends. I'd rather starve myself silly than to make amends. Blood on the altar, blood on the lamb, blood in the chalice, not symbolic, but fresh. So it's nice to liken one's president, you know, to, to Christ. <laughs> That's a little heavy handed, but you know, I, yeah, sometimes I write about the Buddha, sometimes I write about Christ. <laughs> um, so, so, I also wrote a poem for Trump. <laughs> it's called Scary Poem, Inaugural Etude, 2017. Uh, I, yeah, he needed, you know, to have an inaugural poem. Uh, so, and this one's inspired by the great Edgar Allan Poe. Beware the tyrants on the loose, swinging his side and scrotum. Beware he enters your dreams with a face mask and speculum. Beware he crawls on fours and sixes, keeps time with the ancient pendulum. He's pissed as a newt. He changed you to his beliefs. Beware, he will make you disappear. Your history will be rewritten. Beware, he sleeps in the same room. His smell is oddly human. Beware, he's a territorial beast. He'll carve you into 12 provinces. Beware, he flaunts his conquests beating his snared drum of flesh. Beware he's texting your sister while spraying his toxic jism. Beware he's 10,000 years old and will survive the Nexus pogroms. Beware he's the killer legacy. No muzzle, no museum can hold him. Trump is not that dangerous. It's, <laughs> But it's, it, it's fun, you know, <laughs> it's fun to trash him, okay. Um, is there a poem you want to hear, Robert? I, I, I guess I sent you the wrong, yeah. Uh, Don't worry. Different stuff. Um. I'm just having a quick glance through. One I'd written down was Formosan Elegy. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah, going back to... Um, I can find it now. Um, yes. Uh, 
so the, this is uh, this is you know a elegiac ballad. So this you know this is uh, more of a, the Western you know uh, elegy is is uh, based on more uh, of a wet on the Western elegy, uh, the English elegy, uh, elegiac ba ballad, for Mohsen elegy for Charles. You have died. You have lived six decades. Decades. Oh, uh, start. Start again. <laughs> you have lived six decades, and you have lived none. You have loved many, and you have loved no one. You wedded three wives, but you lie on your cold bed alone. You sired four children, but they cannot forgive you. Knock at emptiness, a house without your love. Strike the pine box, no answer, all hollow. You planted plums near the gate, but they bear no fruit. You raised herbs in the veranda, fresh and savory. I cry for you, but no sound wells up in my throat. I sing for you, but my tears have dried in my gullet. Walk the old dog, give the budgies a cool bath. Cut a tender melon, let it bleed into memory. The robe you washed, hangs like a carcass flayed. The mug you loved is stained with old coffee. Your toothbrush is silent. Grease mums your comb. Something's lost, something's made strong. Around the corner, a new prince yearns to be loved. A fresh turn of phrase, a bad strophe erased. A random image crafts itself into a poem, a sleepless Taipei night, a mosquito's symphony. Who will cry for you, me and your sister, Colette? Who will cry for you, me and your Algerian sister? You were a rich man, but you held on to your poverty. You were a poor man who loved gold over dignity. I sit near your body bag, and sing you a last song. I sit near your body bag and chant your final sutra. What's our place on earth? Nada, nada, nada. What's our destiny? War, grief, maggots, nada. Arms, cheeks, cock, femur, eyelids, nada. Cow, ox, lamb, vellum, marrow, nada. Vova nada, semen nada, ovum nada, eternity nada, heaven nada, void nada. Birth and death, the same blackened womb. Birth and death, the same white body bag. Detach, detach, we enter the world alone. Detach, detach, we leave the world bone lonely. If we can't believe in God, we must believe in love. We must believe in love. We must believe in love. And they zip you up in your white body bag, white body bag, white, white body bag. Ooh, it's hard to read that in this, <laughs> oh, after this pandemic. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh. So. Thank you. Sorry, sorry for that. Uh, thank you. Well, a poem I've been very fascinated by is Hospital Interlude. I'm sorry, it's still not much more cheerful. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what page? Okay, let me find it. Okay. Page before, I think. Oh, okay. <clears throat> I'm trying to find hospital interviews. Okay, 93. Okay, yeah, this is hospital interlude is a um, I is is a poem in rounds. So yeah, so it is. It is very. It's it's formal. Yeah. Um, so um, um, 
I, I, I was think, listening to Bach when I, was, <laughs> when I was writing this. So this is about the hospital in, in Portland, Oregon. It's on a hill. It's called Pill. It's a hospital in Pill Hill. And my, my mother uh, was, you know, in, uh, dying in the hospital. Hospital interlude. I rented the red Miata. I returned to the hospital. I returned to the hospital and climbed the wall. I climbed the wall through a dim lit corridor. The dim lit corridor leads to her empty sick room. Her sick room was empty, but the moon was full. The moon was full. The cicadas, the cicadas were crying. The cicadas were crying. Her unmade bed in the moonlight. Her unmade bed in the moonlight, an eternal stain. I veered and turned, but I couldn't find the exit. I couldn't find the exit, I said to my mother. I said to my mother, the song is not over. The song is not over. You forgot to tutor me. You forgot to tutor me the last secret phrases. The last secret phrases in my rented red Miata. In my rented red Miata, I veered and turned. I veered and turned, but couldn't find the exit. I couldn't find the exit, the rain in my hair. Thank you, Thank you Robert, Thank you. <laughs> for remembering that poem. <laughs> so, so but I think, yeah. Um, uh, Shall we? Yeah, is my 15 minutes up? <laughs> I've lost track. <laughs> yeah, 15 minutes up. Okay. <laughs> Maybe it's time to go to some questions then. If, okay. Th thank you. Thank you very much for that. For that. Okay. So thank the all three of you for three amazing and, and very different readings. Um, I've got a, half, about half a dozen questions I was going to ask you in order to kind of get a discussion going. And the first one was a question which has come up in some of the other, the first two events, uh, which is the question of, of home, which is also there in the title of Jenny's uh, book of poems. Um, I was reading Wang Kung Yu's memoir, Home is Where We Are, and I thought that, and in it he raises the questions, does home have to be a country or a city? Is home this house rather than another house? And also by implication, is home really a relationship with another with another person. And I was going to throw out then the question about whether the idea of home is thing that you feel is relevant to your own work. I don't know whether Jenny wants to start with that since it's in your in your title. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I, I'll just uh, kind of kick off with them. I'm sure that I, I really wanted to know what Marilyn Mergy <laughs> thing about this. Um, because I, I suppose yeah, it doesn't have to be a, a specific location, but um, but for me, I think it's every time. So if you think about it as in terms of a country or a city or a place, um, every time I go back home after a short while, I feel very frustrated. <laughs> I feel easily like, oh my god, is this my home? Like, is this what I always I I'm always missing? I just uh, feel always very torn, and then I almost sometimes almost resisted the urge to fly back. But it's not, it's not that I don't love, I mean, of course I love being back, going back home, but um, I think um, as time goes by, many things are, uh, are changing and also your, and my, I myself are, am changing. And so the relationship is always changing. And I think it's very hard to grasp it as, uh, as just a physical uh, um, place as such. Um, but the attachment, I think for me, it's the emotional attachment to the people um, whom I miss. And in a way, I just wish that there is a way to, to have um, everyone that I love um, around me in one single place, but which can't be achieved. So um, how about Regine and Marilyn? Regine? Yeah, I could jump in real quick. Um, yeah, I, I feel like um, I have that line in one of my poems, which is that home is where you don't have to explain yourself. And I think I found that quite useful in thinking through 
because I think home is very complicated for me. Like Jenny, I'm from Hong Kong, but I've been living in London since 2012. And I call both places home. But this idea of not having to explain yourself, I think is quite intriguing because you can think about it in ways of just literally not having to explain your cultural references, right? Your values. Um, as a queer person, I often have to explain a lot of my choices when I'm home in Hong Kong, ironically, because we don't have the same reference points with regards to, you know, queer folk uh, in the UK. And so I kind of have to almost recalibrate when I'm there and, and over explain myself or over justify myself. Whereas in the UK, then my Chineseness or my the things I take for granted back home in Hong Kong suddenly become exotic and foreign here. And so there's in, way, in some ways, both places feel awkward. Um, and, and yet also, um, I think Robert might touch on this later, is this idea of, you know, to whom do I owe an explanation of, of my life, right? Um, in a way, I, I like the idea of an opacity of self, which is that, you know, we have the right to remain unknowable and complex and uh, unfathomable, but why do we feel we have to be rendered transparent and 2D and easily consumable? And it's, I think it's, usually minority uh, folk who find that you have to almost make yourself palatable to a certain group. And I mean this in a queer context and in a racialized context. So for me, that that's what I grapple with when I think of home um, and explaining oneself. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Marilyn? <laughs> <laughs> well, when, when Robert offered this question, I, you know, I thought about it for a while and I, uh, I always feel like an outsider and as a poet, Poets are always outsiders because, especially in a, in America, they don't give a damn about poets, right? We're just like the bastard, uh, you know, children of literature. <laughs> I, I I feel that way. Um, um, but it, but I was born in Hong Kong, came to the United States when I was seven, and I, you know, I went all over the country to you know uh, as an undergraduate and a grad and and, and as a graduate, and I taught all over and. Um, but I, see, I, I now feel California is my home, although I'm, you know, um, and California is, is that messy, you know, multicultural mix that, that is the, the planet's future. And I live in San Diego, which is right on the Tijuana border. So, so uh, you know, I'm, I'm learning some Spanish. My, my Spanish really sucks, but I, I feel that I am, you know, um, um, a Californian, you know, whether California accepts me or not. Um, but I, you know, I am a transnational person. Usually I fly around. I have, it, it, as you can hear in my poetry, my poetry roams. It has, um, um, yeah. And, and recently during the lockdown, I've been visiting this local lake <laughs> near my house and that place is my salvation. So my home, uh, you know, during the lockdown, is is that lake and 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 the and the birds and the and the water birds they're you know they're my friends so so yeah i i guess california is my home <laughs> right. i was very struck that for jenny home automatically implies hong kong that that's what you started talking about as, as in terms of home uh, whereas what i was getting from mary jean's poems was a sense of the real sense of pressure and discomfort of being in in, in england at this present time. Um, that there was a real sense of fear and anxiety about this particular location. Uh, yeah, maybe I could jump in briefly. I suppose it was a very sort of time-bound feeling. And, and yet, I think there is a sense where, because I now live in the UK, and I often talk to friends from Hong Kong, and we, we all know, especially with Jen's lovely poem that you read, the last poem, about how Hong Kong has been such a fraught place for those of us who live overseas. There's almost a kind of guilt of why wasn't I back? I think Jenny mentioned that. And why wasn't I there to kind of be a part of all that? And, and yet I think there's also a kind of slight romanticization of the elsewhere, you know, that everything is great where you are, it, it must be the case. And yet that's not entirely true. And I think I often find it hard to talk about that side of things when clearly things are so fraught back home. Um, and yet I, I did feel for me that there was a crisis that we were going through, especially last year with the beginning of COVID and the increase in racism towards East Asian folk. I mean, that was well documented and obviously it was really well documented in the US. I think there was a kind of concurrent epidemic of that racism happening in the UK that wasn't really spoken about mm -hmm. as much. So I think that's where the poems came into uh, the picture. 
Yeah, because the other thing that occurred to me was the idea of, of family as a possible another way of approaching home, and but obviously family then is present. I felt in a lot of your poems, but present in very in very different in very different ways. Um, a thing which is also problematic, as well as being a t as as well as being um, perhaps a, um, a past that you have a connection to and worry about your ongoing connection to. I don't know whether that is is something that you feel is is going on in your work. Yeah, your just, birth? yeah. Um, we generally went back to, but, um, I, I, sorry, just wanted to jump in a little bit and I felt like, you know, that sense of dislocation, it's quite universal. I mean, mm -hmm. of course, uh, here we, we all share the affinity um, of some memories of Hong Kong, and, but, but I feel that like everyone, um, even if they were born in and grew up in the same place and, and have always lived in the same place, somehow that sense of dislocation might still exist. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know if sympathy can help or empathy can help to bridge a kind of difference oh. or, or as Marilyn mentioned, something about poetry roaming and being that sense of freedom um, for all of us. Mm. Anyone want to? Well, you know, the home is in the imagination. We, we don't need the imagination doesn't need a passport to, you know, to Rome. And during the, the, uh, the crisis with, you know, uh, these, this random violence against Asians and, you know, and, you know, and I don't know, some, somebody yelled at me, do you eat bat shit? <laughs> and I said, no, you know, <laughs> F you. And so that's just, um, and that will, you know, um, you know, we I, I have to re we have to remember that that Asians are the majority. <laughs> there are so many Chinese people in the world, right? But in it, but in the in the U.S., we are still the you know we are you know uh, part uh, you know of the minority coalition, and and so I speak to minority issues, you know, in in the work. I'm I see myself as a political poet, um, but but yeah. Um, I forgot what, what Robert's question was. <laughs> it, rather, it rather wondered about family in whatever sense that was going to be defined and what, what kind of... Um... Yeah, yeah. Well, my, my family, yeah, my family was so, uh, so messed up that I don't want to think about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, it's, <laughs> it's, yeah. Um, yeah, my, fa yeah, I think, you know, home is the, is the poetry. I mean, it's just... I guess that's really sad for my case. I mean, that's, I feel that, um, yeah. you know, I'm sort of a poetry nerd. This is, um, yeah, it's, it's the poetry tribe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll move on to the second question, which in some ways already been answered this evening about what kind of cultural resources are you conscious of drawing on? In some ways, um, Marilyn, you've already shown that in the way in which you move from the blues through to Bach in the course, in the course of that reading. Yeah. But I just want to throw the question out more generally to the three of you. I don't know whether Marilyn, would you like to start with that? Oh, um, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, um, of course I majored in classical Chinese poetry as an undergrad, so I have, I feel like I have a strong, strong, mm -hmm. you know, uh, foundation in, in classical Chinese poetry, but I also uh, was a poetry nerd. So very young, I read lots of poetry. So you can see East and West in my work. And, and, and I love playing with forms. Um, and my, you know, and my, uh, in, in Iowa, my, uh, my favorite teacher was Donald Justice, who was a neo-formalist. And I learned, <laughs> and so, it, um, so you can hear, you know, my playing with form and my, um, my love of form, Eastern and Western form, and how I try to hybridize and try to mix up, you know, the pot is, you can you can hear it in my work, but but I also la love African American literature and and music. I love all kinds everything from Bach to to hip hop. So you can hear, um, and that's the way you know I get my rebelliousness because I I still think that I'm you know I'm part of the uh, some some kind of girl band you know <laughs> from the seventies. <70s. laughs> but but you know uh, um, 
Yeah. Uh, so, so I was, yeah, um, I'm influenced by, so that's why you can hear uh, the blues poem is, is my love of Bessie Smith in the blues tradition. And I felt that as a Chinese American poet, of course I must, you know, uh, um, you know, a heart back to, to the blues, to the African American music, because that is an important part of American culture. So, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, so, so I, I learned from everything. I, now I'm taking, taking um, Zumba dancing because I want to hear, you know, Spanish, you know, the sp Spanish songs and, and, and hip hop beats and world beat. And, and that's how I keep, you know, I keep present um, in listening to music and, and to hear the beats. Um, so does that answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. Oh, oh Jenny, go ahead. Um, well, I just uh, jump in just to mention, I think, yeah, like everything seems to be able to become poetry. And I think like that's kind of um, what Marilyn mentioned also. Uh, I, I think like when I first started writing poetry, I was just like, I wanted to make concrete, like put into concrete words uh, what what is my world because sometimes um, maybe it's quite individual and it, it could be like the messy table in my <laughs> in, in my family's living room like you know always strewn with things or you know or it can be like um like the movies that I watch and um and um you know things that I've heard in the streets um they all fascinate me and I think um it's maybe it's kind of like a translation so um which is not exactly a translation as well. It's, uh, it, but it's just to kind of document someone's life. And I think um, everyone's story is precious. So that's my yeah. view. I'm conscious about the way in which your collection begins with a fourth century Taoist philosopher, and then mm -hmm. also moves through um, a, a 2000 um, kind of popular romantic film from Hong Kong. <laughs> <laughs> and, yes. Yeah. Mary Jean, did you? Uh, yeah, in terms of form, I've been oddly drawn to sort of French forms recently for my newer work. Um, I've written a Sistina, and then some of the poems you heard earlier were prose poems. And I, I don't know, there's something, obviously prose poetry is almost kind of the opposite of the Sistina where, you know, the Sistina is so rigid and it's so locked in. But um, I wrote a poem also kind of reflecting on race and, and being... Uh, East Asian in, in the UK and somehow it, it manifested as a sustina and it almost felt like the rhythms and the kind of pressure on those six words and the repetition really helped me say what I needed to say mm. and versus the other poem Home which is a prose poem where I almost needed a kind of expansiveness um, to, to sort of really let the I guess the hook which is you know at least da -da -da, um, that sort of works well in a prose poem right and I was conscious of what um, Vani Capadeo the wonderful Vani said that a prose poem is sort of like a room that you can wander around in. And then you sort of notice what's on the walls and you notice what's on the coffee table and, and the kind of details of the poem become the fixtures in the room. And I quite like that idea. So I've been kind of oscillating between the sonnet and the Sistina versus the prose poem, which are two extremes, I suppose. Thank you. Um, yesterday, it was interesting hearing Felix Chow reading a poem that mixed Honglish and Cantonese. And so, <laughs> The question I was going to ask then is um, what you felt your relation was to English or American speech rhythms and whether this was something you were conscious of when you wrote. You can also broaden that out to other language speech rhythms as well. Mary Jean, would you like to kick off with that? Or? Uh, yeah, I could sort of uh, take a quick stab at that. Um, I suppose for me, English was something I don't really know whether I have a kind of American English or English English sensibility in my poetry because I did my undergrad in the States. So I, some of my vocabulary, some of my syntax is American versus obviously some words are again acquired in the UK and I grew up in Hong Kong. So um, I think I've always just been conscious of 
shifting the way I talk and write in accordance to, you know, where I was at the time. So in Hong Kong, I was obviously learning it through school. We we're studying Ted Hughes and Plath and all these, you know, Matthew Arnold and Tennyson. And then, so there was a kind of that kind of formalism in terms of the, the diction I was grasping. And then I went to the U.S. and realized people didn't speak in long sentences. And, you know, I shouldn't greet people in, in such a formal manner that I started almost becoming a bit more casual in the way I spoke and wrote. And so I think it does shift for me. And then now I'm obviously based in the UK. So then there's again, maybe a, a more of a kind of slight formality to my work um, compared to when I was in the States. So, and also because I read differently as well, when I was in the States, I read mostly American poets. And then now I'm conscious of that, maybe sort of Anglo-American bias. And I'm trying to read more globally as well um, and in translation. And again, I think reading in a different language even if it's translated back into English, it affects your syntax and the way you use words and put mm. words together. So um, I think it's shifting all the time. Jenny? Um, yeah, I, yeah I, I, thinking of language, I just have to say that like uh, Marilyn's and Mary Jean's works um, have always, um, you know, been such an inspiration for me uh, in terms of language, because I speak like that sort of, uh, dynamics or, or fascination with different languages and what it can say and what it can't and how you bridge that gap. But um, I, I think also um, increasingly I've realized that, you know, like maybe we need to be comfortable with that sort of, that sort of, um, that different languages and, you know, um, and cultures are in our minds and, and we just have to somehow reflect that and, um, I think yes, I agree with you, like about Felix Chow's um, poems, and um, and and sometimes I think there's just so many wonderful things you can do with language, and it doesn't matter if it's like, you know, like nowadays. I think I remember when when I um, edit the poetry um, that I publish, and um, Nina, um, my editor, she she used to say like, is he really? Do you really need to italicize things that? Um, that you actually are so familiar with. And I think like that's very fascinating for me. So like kind of affirmation of what you know uh, and you know, what you own. And um, yeah, so that's for me like quite an interesting question. Mm. Marilyn? Well, there, there are many ways to write a poem, right? Um, a poem is artifice, it's not, it's an artful construct. So sometimes a line is melodic and sometimes it's spoken word. Sometimes it shouts with rage. Sometimes it's a conversation. So what? So it's really a poet's uh, job is to merge form with content and whatever the, you know, the poem will tell you how to speak it or how to sing it or how to dance it or shout it. So, so you know, I don't think that it, um, uh, that is one way to write you know, write a poem and um, uh, to, uh, um, and there's so, there are many Englishes, you know, <laughs> yeah. and that's, that's what's so fun about listening to world music. It's just, and, and I, my students have, they're from everywhere in, in San Diego. They're just, uh, and, uh, and so I, I, yeah. So sometimes uh, we speak, you know, in, uh, in, in kind of, yeah, yeah, in, in kind of pidgin English, you know, from different, different parts of the world. And, um, but, but yeah, we can use everything in the poem, you know, we could, you know, we, we, we it's, uh, that's wonderful about, uh, about listening. Yeah. Right. Because my related question or kind of converse of that is whether you have a particular reader or a sort of reader in mind when you write. Who's, who's answering this first? <laughs> <laughs> and you <Jordan> stop with that. <laughs> okay. I don't know. Oh yeah, I, I think like um, just a little bit, uh, it reminds me when I was writing um, um, my poetry, sometimes I h hope that there, there are more bilingual, uh, well, I, I, I shouldn't impose on that, you know, I'm really happy that whoever can read my work and whoever appreciates poetry, but um, when I write, I just wish, for example, this piece of information of um, Ga, like that, um, the character Ga or Jia in, in my poem, I just wanted to let them know this is like the word that is the same in simplified and traditional Chinese. <laughs> I'm gonna just tell you that. And I, yeah, and I think like to, to me, like, you know, if the 
the reader can go to many different places that they choose um, in terms of uh, reading our work. So, you know, I think it's, you know, it doesn't matter. Anyone who appreciates poetry and who can feel moved by our poems, that will be the wonderful reader. Right, thank you. <laughs> Mary Jean, did you? Yeah, I suppose um, there is a part of me that wants to say, you know, I completely agree with Jenny that really it's, I think a poem is meant to be a kind of universal language and you know, whoever can find any meaning in what I write, you know, whether it's to do with family or to do with wanting to feel like one belongs to a country, you know, they, these are quite universal feelings that can really reach across different cultures, and different countries. But, you know, for example, in Flesh, I think often a lot of my poems, I had the invisible reader in my mind and that was my mother, um, even though she would never read those poems. So it was interesting to see, for example, Ocean Vong write his novel, um, as a kind of book that his mother would never read. And, and that to me was a really wonderful concept. And I guess I already kind of subconsciously had that in the back of my head as well, because my mother can't read English. Um, and so it gave me the freedom to write a lot of the poems in flesh, mm. but also increasingly it's found its way into the uh, hands of queer folk, um, both in Hong Kong and elsewhere. And that's been so wonderful to me that, you know, almost, I never realized that this was the readership that I had written the poems for, if that makes sense, and an unintended uh, group of people who, you know, in many ways have experiences that I've had. So that's mm. been a kind of newfound audience, I suppose. Um, yeah, so I'll just stop there. Right. Marilyn? <laughs> so um, I write for the best reader possible, right? The best nerdiest, you know, yeah, reader. Ref, you know, mirroring myself, right? <laughs> this is narcissism, right? Um, no, I, I never write down to the reader. And, and having been in, you know, write, you know, I've, I've been writing for a long time. It's interesting how um, different poems pop up as, you know, uh, as people's favorites. So, so uh, having written for so, so long, uh, it's an interesting uh, taking my uh, selected poems um, around the country and do uh, doing readings that um, uh, that people have their favorites and and it's just, it, it speaks to the longevity of a career it's uh, writing poetry is a practice and you just can't write just uh, just what's fashionable you know what I mean it's just it you know um, um, I don't know if you know um, if once upon a time it was not fashionable to write sonnets and and suddenly last year everybody wrote sonnets and I and I told my students stop writing sonnets read read them first and <laughs> study them first don't write just because uh, you can count you know because you have to absorb the work and really give um, you know give the poem give the poem uh, and and the form uh, um, uh, you know um, uh, give them res give respect to the form to the traditions. Uh, and you can play whatever, you know, but, uh, but yeah, so, so yeah, I thought about this, uh, this question, and I think um, it's important to, to, to write the best poem possible, and, and for, and, and give, you know, send it out to the best reader possible, even if they don't understand what a sustain is, or they don't understand what in heck you're doing. Um, it's, um, but um, you will find your readership. Right, yeah. My last question then relates to something that Jenny mentioned a moment ago, which is um, my first wife is a Bengali children's writer in Calcutta. And when she wrote fiction for adults in English in England, she was always under pressure to explain the culture to English readers. And so I wonder whether you felt under pressure to explain a culture, or do you accept that areas of your poetry will be opaque to some readers and that's just the way it has to be or even the way it should be? And I was going to start with Mary Jean, since she and I have talked about this in the past. Yeah, I think, you know, going back to what Jenny was saying about bilingual poetry, which I think is wonderful and necessary. And, you know, I do believe that such words, um, you know, shouldn't be translated like, ga, you know, if even if someone doesn't know Chinese, then they'll find a way to, to understand that word. Or if not, they can appreciate the visual 
beauty of that character on the page. You know, there, there's some way of accessing it. Or if it's in a language that's phonetic, then someone can try to pronounce the sound. You know, I don't speak Spanish, but I love reading poetry that is bilingual in English and Spanish. And I appreciate that actually there's no translation um, because it puts the two languages on the same um, level. Essentially, they're of equal importance. And so I do believe in a kind of necessary opacity that there are parts of my work that you know, if people are from Hong Kong and they're queer, they might really tap into a layer that is inaccessible to someone who hasn't really been through that exact, exact same experience, but that's completely fine. Whereas someone who, I don't know, is born and raised in the UK might understand a bit more about what I'm saying in terms of uh, the poem about being in London and experiencing a certain thing, but, um, and that might be less familiar to someone in Hong Kong. And I think that's just, you know, rather than really rendering everything almost to the lowest common denominator and saying that here this is a guidebook as to how to read. Um, I think poetry always kind of has to contain a certain level of, of mystery at its heart. Not that poetry needs to be woefully difficult, even though there's some poetry that is difficult. And I think experimental poetry that tries to be you know, linguistically complex, and that's also a way of writing poetry, and that's great. But I mean to say that I don't really believe in this need to explain oneself. It goes back to that, you know, it's a very unhomely feeling when you feel like everything you do needs to be kind of rendered transparent mm -hmm. in order for you to be acceptable mm -hmm. or accepted. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you. Jenny, did you? Yeah. Um, yes, I think like um, in terms of like, I also kind of agree with Marjean that we don't, poetry is like, precious because it, you you don't have to explain yourself and um there's kind of this validation of the feeling and um there's a sense of authenticity that about the language that that you know as long as you're being authentic about it um instead of just kind of doing it for its sake um i mean i earlier actually i was quite a long time that i resisted putting anything that is uh, uh yeah like you know um bilingual in it but I think on the other hand it's not about bilingual or not it's just about like how your mind works and how your imagination works and how you kind of transform that to or say it to the reader um I I um yeah so which is why I kind of um think it's that opacity I mean Marilyn Mary Jean's poem, for example, I just love the fact that I can't assess some of the, you know, I can never assess totally what it is, but that's what fascinates me about a poem. Um, yeah. I guess there's, <laughs> there's so much magic in, in poetry and I just, um, um, but, you know, in in my um, in my um, um, my 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 fiction uh, book, uh, <laughs> my wild girl fiction book, I have pages and pages of notes. Why not? I just like, oh my gosh, I'm, I just you know, I want to explain this. I want to dedicate that. I'm going to be didactic here and whatever. And if you don't like it, that's too bad. You know, and and there are some poems that. That of course uh, are inexplicable, and and you know and and is and they're written through divine intervention or something, <laughs> but but yeah yeah I I don't see anything wrong with have you know having an appendix with um, with expl explanations because I think students will be reading um, all kinds of people read read those poems and and you know. Um, you know, um, sometimes, you know, uh, they need to know that I am writing, although, so, you know, they probably know by the, with the title Blues on Yellow, that is, um, that there's a blues poem in there, but it helps to know that I was a fan of Bessie Smith, yeah. you know, and so if I, I wrote that, you know, uh, and, and, and Veer asked the reader to, uh, to listen to her podcast, to, to uh, one, one, one of her songs. And so, it's, you know, that's all I have to say. <laughs> right. We're getting some questions coming in. I know Dino Mahoney's been waiting for a while, so I was going to ask if Dino would like to start off the, the third section of the Q&A with your question. You've been very patient. Oh, <clears throat> oh, oh, thank you. Oh, well, I just have to say this has been the most fantastic reading. Uh, I mean, three knockout readings. Thank you 
so much. I've really enjoyed. I've really enjoyed it. And um, I, I, I just wanted to ask you what it, what it's um, how you've adapted to Zoom. You know, because you all three of you have read so brilliantly, and it's kind of like bust through the screen and everything. And and as we're living in the time of Zoom and we're poets and we're doing so much stuff on Zoom, I just just thought it's kind of a you know, just to ask you how you how you're coping with Zoom. Are you still in love with it? Are you is it love hate? What is it? And because you because I think you've all mastered it. You're all great at it. So it'd be good to get some tips. <laughs> Over to you. <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, I, yeah, I can't wait to get on the road again to do a bunch oh, of- But Marilyn, you're so good on Zoom. You're brilliant. <laughs> oh my God, I've had sessions in which I, I was muted completely. And I, <laughs> I, I had a session which I, I, you know, I don't know, I, I did, for some reason, my screen was black. So I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, no, it's, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a lear there's a learning curve here, yeah. But I can't wait to to actually, you know, um, you know. Uh, but I mean, you seem so. But you seem so relaxed with Zoom, though. I mean, you know what I mean. Well, I'm with, yeah. I'm jamming with my friends. You see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Like, like, like uh, I guess uh, musicians jam together. So I think poets should jam together. Yeah. And you had a question. Would you like to ask it? Yes, uh, thank you so much. This has been a really beautiful reading. Thank you to the three of you. Uh, I was thinking of back to Mary Jean's sense of home being in the poem, uh, or Jenny's notion of home as a feeling that is changing. And so I wondered if, if the three of you might comment a little bit on the relationship or the tension that exists between your last collection and the poems that you are writing now. Does this shift your sense of home as poem makers and does it in any way uh, contribute to an evolving uh, sense of what home is? Um, thanks Yvette, I might try to answer that even though it's, it's a question I haven't really considered. I suppose I've just had my book out two years ago and in many ways, it still feels like it's it's my baby, but then I am sort of moving on now to the second book. So um, I suppose in a way, a collection, once it's published, it becomes its own entity. Um, I remember reading from the book for the first time, you know, rather than from a set of paper. And then I realized I had to sort of relearn the poems in terms of how they were ordered and their place in the collection. It just didn't feel as familiar. And so that feels like this was a home that I've known quite well now for the past two years, having been able to read at it. I read from it at events, you know, both online and in person. And then now it does feel like literally to use a house metaphor that I'm building the new home brick by brick, you know, and the architecture is different, the layouts, the layout's different, the, you know, the materials are different, I suppose. Um, but obviously there are overlaps in terms of, you know, I'm still writing about my mother. I thought I'd probably done that one. Uh, to death slightly but actually those poems are still cropping up but in slightly different ways you know and, and this subject matter is now being treated in a in a different way because my life has moved on as well from from that point in time so um yeah that's not a great answer but that's sort of where I'm at with my work um I yeah I, I, I jump in just a uh, contribute uh, my point of view but um I, I think like yeah, it's really hard to think of an answer to this question, but I guess I'm just still figuring out what home is really like. And and um, and I think I just allow myself to feel uncomfortable about it. And um, even after so many years, I think, um, as Rob mentioned, maybe I kind of automatically assume Hong Kong is my home, but sometimes it's not Hong Kong as well. And sometimes it's England and sometimes it's other you know is in my mind and and I think um it's just the way that you know trying to kind of feel at home with this feeling of not feeling very comfortable of uh, of what Marilyn Chin mentions about being the outsider and trying to explore a bit more about that and allowing myself to to feel uncomfortable and yeah I don't know what that uncomfortable feeling can take it to
But you know, the thing about home, because what I was asking about Zoom and stuff, I'm in Greece at the moment, you know, <clears throat> and you're, 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 you know, you're coming from the set. It's so international. So we're, we're sort of able to connect that way. And everyone's pining for their, you know, their little going back, you know, that intimacy, which is so wonderful. You like, like in London, we go to like mm -hmm. Poetry Society and it seats like 35 people and you can have a very intimate and wonderful. I love that too, but I love this as well. I mean, I've had a blast this evening, a total blast. I suppose I'm a bit worried about it going back into the little venues because I'm a bit of a refugee at the moment. I, I'm, I'm living in Greece. I didn't expect to be here for so long, but it, it but the poetry world has been available to me. I mean, I could come to this reading tonight, you know, and um, and I and I, I guess I'm saying I hope that when COVID is over and we can go back, that we don't forget that the internationalism of this kind of a reading is something very very precious. A question from um, Eva if you'd like to ask that. Oh. Hi. Um, Hi. Sorry. Um, I was thinking about queerness in your work specifically, Mary. Um, it's often described as an othering. And I was just wondering if you saw your experience of queerness reflected in your experiences moving to America and the UK or if you thought they were quite different things um yeah uh yeah that's an interesting question I suppose with queerness it was more it was more of a because you know being queer and I suppose what I was going through back then was was having to come out to people to family and also to colleagues and even to the poetry world whether or not to write about queerness and that involves a decision that kind of involves disclosure if that makes sense whereas moving abroad it felt like in a way the script hasn't been written yet because when you're in a new country that the wonderful thing is as much as it can feel very alienating and dislocating you are free to write a new self but I was carrying my queer self with me. So that kind of experience of feeling like I was worried about people reacting badly and all that, that, that didn't change despite being in a new country. Obviously, you know, because things are a bit more progressive here, that has helped. But um, yeah, I suppose I, I see them as, as slightly different things. The experience of being a kind of racial minority is different to being a queer person, uh, even though there are overlaps in terms of how one is excluded from communities. Hope, hope that helps. Sorry, I realised I cut off um, Marilyn before she had a chance to answer uh, Yvette's question. Uh, I'm trying to find the question again. Okay, we can move on. <laughs> it's okay. Oh, Yvette, um, do, you, do you want to repeat your question? Oh, oh certainly. No, I, my question, Marilyn, was simply if you had any thoughts on how the poems in your most recent publication uh, existed in relation or intention with the most recent poems, uh, and if and if the idea for this question comes from Linda Gregerson, who found that her early poems were claustrophobic in their form, and so she created the tercet that became her signature. And so I wondered if you had noticed any shift in the, or uh, tensions between your your most recent book and the poems you're writing now. Okay. Well, the, okay. So uh, yeah. Um, yeah um um okay the the last book is is a book of uh, it's it's uh, selected new and selected right and so it go yeah it goes back yeah i, I selected from 30 years of work and um well it, it's right now i'm doing some uh a poems i call impromptu <laughs> so i just i the the I, I, I go to the duck pond and I just write whatever. And I just, and so I'm, 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 I'm doing jazz right now. <laughs> cause I've been, and, and I, cause I, I basically, as you can hear, I'm, I'm very controlled. You know, I control my, I don't know. I mean, it's just for, I'm a very, and, and I, 
you know, I, my friends would uh, write uh, a book every two years. I take, you know, I, I throw out a lot and I, I've been very controlling of my, uh, my, uh, you know, production. Right. But, uh, but lately I'm just, you know, I'm just playing around and see what, and so the new, the new work might, I, I don't let myself get very sloppy, but the new work, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's, I, I, I'm playing around and see if I could, uh, I could get a little sloppier. Right. But, but I, you know, I don't know. I'm controlling. What can I say? <laughs> um, but every book's different. Every child has its, you know, has its own identity. And and I've always been a, uh, you know, a, uh, yeah, um, uh, a political poet. Yeah. But I, I've all, I, I also love beauty in language and in form. So so um, so also when I I wrote my my fiction that my bad girl fiction oh my gosh so i so i want to write more bad girl fiction you know and and be almost pornographic if i can <laughs> no i just no i mean i i am rebellious i'm deeply rebellious it's just a very strange personality in which on, on the one hand i am very controlled and formal but on the other hand i am totally in your face and rebellious so try to m meld the two personalities it's just it, you know it, it sort of uh, is a mashup and sometimes it's is wonderful and sometimes is you know it's a fail you know it's a fail experiment so that's it's, it's just wonderful that we have this canvas to you know uh to play on and I, and also i'm so i feel so blessed to be a poet to be able to make my life as a poet you know for so many years so so I just, you know, play whatever. I, the thing is, for young poets, be courageous. Just freaking be courageous. Don't worry about what the poetry world thinks of you or what so and so. You know, just just freaking be courageous because, because, as I said, it, it, as Arden says, you know, poetry makes nothing happen. So you gotta make it happen. <laughs> Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so stay tuned for some wild girl stuff. That's all I have to say. <laughs> that might be a good point at which to, um, wind, wind you, up because yeah. <laughs> I'm very, I'm very conscious that, uh, we've gone eight minutes over the time I'd originally oh. allotted to us. Um, I don't, oh, I don't see any more questions unless I'm missing things. Um, but I, I feel I'd like to thank all three poets for what's been an amazing reading. And also for these, this wonderful discussion that you've had where you've been uh, jamming together on these various topics. So uh, again, thank you all three of you. I'd like to ask, invite the audience to, I'd like to thank the audience for their contributions as well and um, invite them to apl applaud you for your evening's work. <laughs>